Yeah, so this is for Architecture 585. We have the situation where there are all of these incentives out there for both private developers and for local government to grow and grow and grow and expand. But at the same time, that growth is constrained so that it can't happen in traditional, you know, dense city centers where, you know, traditionally you might have a city that reaches a certain level of development and then when it, when it expands, it'll expand in two ways. It will expand out to some extent, primarily with residential development, and then it will, it will expand inwards by densifying, by going higher, by increasing the, let's say, the intensity of, of certain uses. And so what zoning has done is it's really flattened all of that out. You know, it takes a certain degree of development, let's say, within a city center, and says, okay, this is enough. You know, we have, we've defined where the city center is, where the commercial stuff is, how much commercial stuff there can be, but then everything else around that is residential. Not only is it residential, but it's single-family residential. It's what we would call sprawl. When growth happens, it just keeps going out and out and out. And then to support all of that, the city then needs to expand roads, to expand pipes, you know, water and sewer. They're expanding power lines. They're expanding their service areas for fire and police, school systems, school buses. All of that stuff just starts to get spread out in a larger area, but with less and less people per square foot. To me, there are some obvious remedies there <laughs> from a libertarian standpoint. So for one thing, yeah, take away all these, these zoning restrictions, allow mixed-use development everywhere, allow more dense types of construction everywhere. But then the other side of that, I guess the second point, is that you shouldn't have government just expanding roads and sewers without the developments that it's serving paying for that. At least start pricing the roads in a way that the people who are using the roads are paying for the roads and other utilities that they're using. If you start to do that, even just that simple step of just pricing things for what they cost to the users, that can start to change the thinking about what should be built and where and who should be paying for it. Welcome to An Architecture, episode 28. Several months ago, I was contacted by John Ellis, who is an architecture student in the School of Architecture and Urban Planning at the University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee. John has been listening to An Architecture for a while, and when he started working on his thesis project for his Master of Architecture degree, he reached out to me to ask if I would be an advisor for his project. So we've been going back and forth for a while. We had a long conversation a, a few months ago as he was conceptualizing the project, and we've been emailing each other back and forth ever since then. And I have to say that seeing all of these cool little drawings he's been sending me uh, has been making me wish that I was back in architecture school. Although you'll hear later in the podcast, he talks about how little sleep he's getting, which makes me glad that I'm not. In one of his classes, he had an assignment to record a podcast. So I agreed to do an interview with him to present our way of thinking to his classmates, who apparently will be forced to listen to it. As you'll hear, John's a really bright guy, and we had a wide-ranging conversation touching on many of the ideas that Joe and I have explored on our podcast in the four years that we've been doing it. As I listened back to it, I realized that this was actually a pretty good introduction for people who are discovering our podcast for the first time to get an overview of the variety of topics that we've touched on in the past. So based on that and the fact that hopefully we've got some new listeners after my recent appearance on The Tom Woods Show talking about short-term rentals, and of course the fact that this is now going to become course material for an unlucky group of architecture students, we're going to call this episode An Architecture 101. We want to make this an episode that we can refer people back to as a starting point for finding out what we're all about. So before we get into the interview, I just want to take a few minutes and give a quick synopsis of a handful of our podcast episodes, which we referenced in the interview, and which I would encourage people to go back and listen to if they're interested in the subject matter. For anyone hearing this for the first time, I'll introduce myself. My name is Tim Brochu. I'm an architect living in Maine, and I co-host An Architecture Podcast together with my identical twin brother, Joe, who is an engineer living in Australia 
working in the energy industry, uh, specifically working on power plants. Our tagline for Ann Architecture is the built environment of a stateless society. So our goal is to bring libertarian principles to discussions about the built environment, about urbanism, about infrastructure and community, as well as to introduce libertarians to discussions that are happening about the built environment. Our first three episodes we called our Foundation Series. Episode one, we defined the built environment and talked about some different ways to think about it and some issues that come up there. In episode two, we defined libertarianism and the non-aggression principle and discussed some problems that we see in the built environment that result from governmental policies and actions. And in episode three, we proposed anarchic, non-governmental alternatives that start to suggest some ways to resolve some of the problems that government has created in the built environment. We start the interview in this episode with a bit of a bio on me, and I talk about how I took a break from my career as an architect in 2015 to travel the world with our young family. Our episodes six and seven, we call our Citizen of Nowhere series, talk about that experience, and we reflect on that experience as well as Joe's experiences traveling and immigrating to Australia to talk about the concept of freedom of movement, and we analyze border controls and immigration and the effects that those have had on the development of the built environment, and how certain ways of thinking about the built environment can offer some solutions to what some people view as problems with allowing more open borders. So we talk about things like, for example, expansion of housing, immigrant enclaves, and allowing for what we call sidewalk entrepreneurship, which you'll hear me talk about in my interview with John. And if you just want to hear a great travel story, episode 20 was a talk I gave at the Free Coast Festival in New Hampshire where I talked about an experience we had in Panama where, let's just say, the infrastructure couldn't be taken for granted. And my realization from that experience about the importance of community, even within a philosophy like libertarianism, which is often thought of as individualistic. John also asked me how I got into libertarianism, which I go into in some detail here. If you want to hear more of that, check out episode 15, which was an interview I did with Danilo Cuellar of the Peaceful Anarchism podcast which was another good overview of a lot of the ideas that we talk about on our podcast. Of course, the ubiquitous question of who will build the roads came up, which I dug into a bit here in this interview. This relates to a topic that has been really important to Joe and I in understanding a lot of the things that we talk about on the podcast, which is an understanding of public space and what that means in a libertarian society. I had the opportunity to speak two times at Porkfest, which is the Free State Project's Porcupine Freedom Festival in New Hampshire. And both of these talks were focused on this topic of public space. The first one was episode 13, and then Joe and I did a follow-up in episode 14, where we also introduced this concept of opt-in trusts, which we have promoted as one possible type of entity that could allow for non-governmental, voluntary public ownership of assets like roads and parks if and when those things were ever to be divested from government ownership. We also talk a lot about access rights on public space, and we challenge some orthodox libertarian ideas, in particular some of the ideas of Hans Hermann Hoppe, about how access to certain spaces can and should be controlled in a libertarian society. Most of that criticism is in the second speech I gave, which was our episode 19, which was titled Public Space, The Missing Link Between Freedom and Property. Early in the episode, John mentioned Patrick Schumacher, and we talked about him a bit more at the end of the episode. Patrick is one of the world's most prominent architects as a principal of Zaha Hadid Architects. Zaha Hadid was a groundbreaking architect, and Patrick, after working alongside her for 30 years, took over leadership of the firm. They do some amazing stuff. They're truly on the cutting edge of both design and design technology and construction technology. If you've never seen any of their work, just hit pause and and do a quick Google search on Zaha Hadid Architects, and you'll get an idea of why I find Patrick so intriguing. Of course, the other reason I find Patrick so intriguing is that he has described himself as an anarcho-capitalist and has written some very thought-provoking pieces on the intersection between libertarian ideas and architecture and the built environment, and became somewhat notorious for his outspoken views on housing policies back in 2016. Shortly after Patrick found himself in a a firestorm of publicity around some of his views, I had the opportunity to interview him, and our episodes 9 through 12 are all focused on Patrick's ideas, with my interview with Patrick in episode 11. I also had the opportunity to record an event with Patrick and Adam Hengels from Market Urbanism, 
which you can listen to at our episode 18. I should say for any Tom Wood Show listeners who have just found us, you may remember Patrick from Tom's episode 975. And I should mention that Joe and I were interviewed by Tom on his episode 802, which if the two-hour interview which you're about to listen to is getting a little long for you, you might want to jump back to episode 8 for the half-hour discussion we had with Tom as an introduction to our podcast. John and I briefly mentioned Titus Gable, who is a founder of Free Private Cities, an organization that is trying to develop cities that are run like a market-based service and that negotiate a greater degree of freedom from their host nation than most other cities. You can hear our interview with Titus in episode 25. Finally, John and I talked a lot in this episode about Strong Towns, which is an organization that started as a blog by a guy named Chuck Marone, who is a civil engineer and planning consultant who has created a movement around recognizing many of the problems that cities face, resulting from, among other things, government regulations, infrastructure subsidies, and the kind of debt Ponzi schemes that towns get themselves into, often in response to federal and state policies. Joe and I had the opportunity to interview Chuck earlier this year. You can hear that in our episode 23, and then we did a follow-up episode on that with our own thoughts, which is episode 24. I'll stop there. Obviously, we have a lot more episodes than that, and I hope we've piqued your interest enough to go back and check out a few of them. We tend to only put out about four or five episodes a year. With Joe being in Australia, it's tough for the two of us to get on any kind of regular recording schedule, and each of our episodes tend to be longer, deep dives into a specific topic. But thank you for checking us out. Wherever you're coming from in the political spectrum, I hope there's something in this interview that you find compelling. This is about a two-hour episode. And I will say that I think some of the best conversations happen towards the end of the episode, where we talk about ways to divest governmental ownership of infrastructure and responsibilities to non-governmental but possibly public forms of ownership. Thanks again for checking us out. Here's my interview with John Ellis. Yeah, so this is for Architecture 585, which is a research methods class Mm -hmm. taught by uh, Whitney Moon, Professor Whitney Moon. And so I know her research is, her personal research was big into like inflatables with like Cedric Price. Hmm. But she, you know, as a professor here, she obviously is helping the rest of the class, like create a research topic that they are spinning off into maybe their thesis Uh or uh, their master's work or PhD. We had one PhD student in there. Hmm. So obviously, since I'm already way down the rabbit hole of thesis, (laughs) I'm double dipping. So I'm kind of using this as like, you know, it is a podcast, but it's also helping evolve the discussion around the thesis that I've kind of developed over the past year. Sure. So I did send you some stuff, but I think generally for the class, it might be good because I we had to show our favorite architecture podcasts. To oh, the class. yes. <laughs> and so it was fun because I got to send, uh, you know, I sent the link to the class and Whitney pulled up an architecture <laughs> websites and uh I could instantly see the eyeballs uh, oh boy. <laughs> wide, wide, widening and then the eyes glaring at me. I just dreading whatever we had on our homepage at whatever moment you actually pulled that up. <laughs> uh, I do not remember, but I'm sure uh, it was spicy. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've gotten used to this being an undergrad at Ball State. I had found Dave Smith's podcast, Part of the Problem, hmm. in 2016. And I say Dave saved me from the dark side. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, you know, you can imagine learning uh, what we know about like Mises and Rothbard for the first time. You kind of like, oh, this is awesome. We get to share this with everybody. Right. Uh, you you got to let them know. You, yeah. You got to let them know. Uh, but then you find out that <laughs> some people, uh, it doesn't go the way you think it's going to go. Yeah. So, yeah, I showed the class your website and there was a lot of questions, a lot of questions. <laughs> That's what we're here for. So I think I, it was nice to say, like, hey, I've talked to Tim. Yeah. He is a real person yeah. uh, and he's not a bad person. <laughs> <laughs> he's a human being and he's an architect, believe it or not, <laughs> who has done things. So maybe ex- just briefly explain why architecture for you. So for me, kind of going back even to my my childhood i can i guess that my first exposure to architecture as maybe a career path um my parents had we had a family friend um who was an architect and i'm thinking around the time i was like 10 or 11 years old i remember at one point we went to um an opening of a new building of his which was a planetarium in new hampshire and i think for me that was when 
I mean, I was young at that point, but I think that was when it clicked that like, this is something that people can do that they can, you know, design buildings and then create these something that doesn't exist in a big way. And I think that was, I think that was something that excited me. Of course, you know, as a kid, I was all into Legos and all this other stuff. And it's, does this seem like kind of like Legos on steroids? And so I think that was my first exposure to it. And then going through high school and starting to think about career paths, architecture for me seemed to tick off a lot of boxes of things that I was interested in. I really liked drawing. As I said, I liked creating things. And I also liked more of the kind of engineering science, you know, math based side of things. And to me, architecture looked like something where I that that could be a creative pursuit, but that also had this really significant problem solving aspect to it. So I did a uh, I did a summer program when I was in high school at Rensselaer Polytech. And then I went to Carnegie Mellon University for college and did a five year um, architecture program there. And then after that, I actually, I had moved back to Boston. I'm from, grew up in New Hampshire, just about an hour north of Boston. I had moved back here after school. I actually ended up going and working for that friend of my parents who had done the planetarium in a, at a firm in New Hampshire and ended up making my, almost my whole career there for 13 years. I worked for this firm. They specialized primarily in, in education and healthcare projects and more institutional projects. They also did some civic and corporate projects as well. And I, for about the last eight years I was working there, I was a project manager working primarily on healthcare projects, so hospitals, medical offices, which is something I liked because for me, again, what, what really interested me about architecture, I was less about the kind of high design side of architecture and you creating this, this big, magnificent, you know, wondrous piece of art. I mean, not Schumacher. <laughs> yeah. Well, but I'll, I'll come back to that. Not, not that I, not that I couldn't appreciate that. But it's just not what really got me out of bed in the morning. For me, I really enjoyed the that problem-solving aspect of it, and the creative problem-solving aspect of it, where it's not just about you know solving a math problem. It's these these multi-dimensional problems that we need to solve as architects to make everything come together. So that's why why healthcare in particular appealed to me because healthcare design, healthcare projects are very process-oriented, and the way that you lay out the space can have a big impact on the way that they deliver care on, on the processes that they do. And so just thinking through those projects in that way um, has been something that, that I've enjoyed. And then in 2015, I actually left that job and my wife and I spent two years traveling actually with our, we had two young kids at the time. We still, we still have the kids. They're not as young anymore. <laughs> they just <laughs> traded me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> But when we left, uh, my daughter was 14 months old and my son was was three years old. And so it was a bit of a leap of faith. But I was at that point a stay-at-home dad, except we weren't at home. And then my wife was able to work remotely um, in some capacity. And so we were in Europe. We were in Central America and the Caribbean. We popped around the States a little bit, visiting family. And we ended up settling in Maine, where we live now. And actually uh, bought our house uh, where we live now um, during that time while we were still traveling. And then when we got back here after all that time was when I started my own practice, which is Adra Architecture, LLC. That's A-D-R-A. And now I've been, I really wanted to kind of start off small. So I've been working with residential clients, you know, mostly homeowners looking at additions and renovations, um, some new builds. But again, it's, it's this idea of working with people to really kind of solve some problem that they have, you know, in their home. It's finding a way to make their homes work for them in the way that they want them to. And I've found that there's a need for that, at least in the area where I am, that there are a lot of people who are, you know, looking to improve their homes, maybe some an aging couple that's thinking about doing a first floor master bedroom as an aging in place kind of suite. Lots of little things like that that people like to do on their houses. Um, so that's been fun with me. You know, I really like meeting homeowners and, and building relationships with them. And again, just finding ways to to help them get them what they want to do on their properties. Wow. Yeah, that's a long, spread out career. You got uh, <laughs> all the scales there. Yeah. So I think uh, naturally, you know, someone's going to be like, oh, wow, like, so he's just an architect, right? Like he does the path of school mm -hmm. to uh, college, right? And then you get your first job, a little bit of life experience. So like, what is an, an architecture then? Like if you're saying this guy uh, has this philosophy, you know, of libertarianism, 
he doesn't really sound like a libertarian. You know, he's helping people. You know, I thought libertarians <laughs> were supposed to be, uh, you know, leave me alone and, uh, you know, don't mess with me type. So I think this is like um, kind of where there's like, you know, either misinformation or a stereotype out there. So like, is your interest with the an architecture podcast that you do with your brother was that spawning from things that you had always kind of been on or was that like a, a recent development? I started getting interested in ideas of libertarianism. It was after school. I mean, I think growing up, I was always kind of politically apathetic. And if you grew up in the 90s, there was really, really no reason not to be politically apathetic. <laughs> there was not much going on in the 90s that really uh, required a lot of, of uh, attention from somebody my age. Yeah. But then, of course, then 9-11 happened. I think that was kind of a wake-up call for me. That was the year that I graduated school and was starting to get into the working world. So it was kind of a time where everything started getting real for me <laughs> in a lot of ways. And so I started getting a little more invested in the political world, in economics. You know, I got a 401k at my at my job. And so I started uh, thinking a bit about about investments and, and the economy and things like that. And I was, as I was looking for sources of information about all of that stuff, there was actually a talk show radio host, um, a local guy in Manchester, New Hampshire named Gardner Goldsmith, who had a he had a just an AM, you know, drive time radio show. But he would start to bring up a lot of these these topics about libertarianism. A lot of his stuff was focused on kind of state politics in New Hampshire. But he would he would talk about some libertarian ideas and even, you know, talk about things like anarcho-capitalism, which, you know, when you hear a word like that, you're like, OK, I have to go and I need to go find out what that means. <laughs> and I think he turned me on to um, some organizations like the Mises Institute and the Foundation for Economic Education. And some other resources out there, maybe the Independent Institute, that had a lot of resources for people to learn about these these kind of philosophies. So I then <laughs> started going down that rabbit hole of just learning about Austrian economics and learning about libertarian ideas in general. And um, I just found it really appealing. I, I, th I thought that it was I appreciated that that kind of rational, logical approach to trying to come up with ideas about morality and, and, and the economy and just understanding how people should be interacting with each other. You know, of course, libertarians never shy away from conspiracies. And whenever you hear that, that you know, the government is doing something big and awful, you know, it, it's kind of stimulating. And I don't go in for a lot of that stuff. But at that time, I think it's something that being able to come in and, and be able to argue, you know, uh, take the counter argument to almost any point that, <laughs> that somebody else was making. That interested me at the time. I was always looking for kind of outside explanations for things. And, and I was never really satisfied with, you know, status quo type of, of thinking and type of, I don't know, sorts of information, let's say. Yeah. And you know, again, I wouldn't, I don't necessarily accept like everything I would read, but I feel like I always felt like it was worthwhile to kind of read some of the most extreme views I could find on, on either side of, of any given issue and then try to come to my own understanding of, of, what I think is, is, is right or wrong about that. Yeah. So it seems like a far more, you know, reasonable approach, you know, than, than maybe some of the extremes are presented in there. So like in architecture though, is a very interesting term. You know, when I brought that up for the first time with like my thesis advisor, Alex Timmer, you know, we started to talk about like Gordon Matta Clark and uh -huh. like uh, yeah. that, that type of stuff. <laughs> I know. I got to find a way to get that guy off, off of the first page of Google when people start to yeah. search on my website. <laughs> yeah, I know. You got to really hit that. <laughs> <laughs> the ad words or something yeah. there. <laughs> but I think there is a little bit of overlap, though, you know, like Matt Clark and the people in that movement were looking at, you know, society, spatial and cultural implications, and also economics, you know, they were concerned about some of that stuff mm -hmm. in their writing and in some of their installations, you know, very Matt Clark, right? He's making a statement by taking the chainsaw to the floor. Yeah, you know, like, there's like things that they're trying to, to push there. You know, even though we might disagree with them on economics side where they were seeing uh, capitalism embodying state corporations and like state action, mm -hmm. whereas we are able to then I think a good point that we should make is we can delineate the difference between, you know, a government action and then just market economy. Mm -hmm. We don't put them at the same thing. But I think for some people, they look at it and it's hard to delineate because of this blurring of the lines between like a private sector and the public sector. So it's, you know, I think it's reasonable when I read like the Siege of Price and, um, you know, maybe he's not an anarchitect, but, you know, writing about those same issues, 
um, I think we can kind of empathize with them a little bit where they're highlighting issues and then just not maybe fully understanding the economics of it. Yeah. You know, I mean, for, for me, I mean, yeah. And I should say that the name of our podcast was not necessarily inspired by Gordon Matta Clark. It was obviously yeah. a combination of anarchism and architecture. You know, we thought we were being clever. Yeah. But of course, I've, I've looked into some of his stuff since then just in the in the interest of, uh, I guess, product disambiguation or whatever. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, you know, I, I I generally have an appreciation for anybody who's willing to, as I said before, kind of challenge status quo thinking and put out, you know, kind of test some kind of extreme ideas. And he did it in ways that I think were interesting. I mean, they were there were these kind of large scale art installations, essentially, that, as you said, I think sought to bring attention to certain ideas about what he perceived, I think, as injustices, you know, historical injustices within the built environment. So um, so I can appreciate that and I have some sympathy for that. But as you said, I mean, I, I think that where I depart from that kind of thinking is in the understanding of economics and markets, in particular, what we would call what I would call the free market, where, as you said, the built environment that we have right now, just like the corporate structures that we have right now, have a lot to do with with the state, with state um, control, state regulations, state, if you want to call it subsidies or protections for certain corporations, for certain patterns of development, for infrastructure, um, state subsidies and, and infrastructure. All of these things create a set of conditions that it's possible for a free market to exist in. But I don't think you can look at the world that we have right now and say, this has been a result of the free market. This is a result of capitalism. And again, I'm sympathetic to the notion that capitalism as we know it today and as it's, it's historically developed has had a lot to do with the state. It's had a lot to do with state protection and, and state privilege. However, I don't go so far as some maybe left anarchists in thinking that if we were able to get to some kind of a society that, that did not have a state in which all the things that government does, if those could be done by other means that don't involve, let's say, taxation and imprisonment and all these other things um, that we as libertarians see as the, as the negatives of government, that if we could get to that kind of a, of a society, I still think we would have things like corporations where there would still be various forms of business organizations. There would be certain legal standards by which they could they could exist and negotiate with each other and with with other people more in the, along the lines of what might be called like traditional common law uh, kind of development mm -hmm. of law where, where law is developed kind of organically over time through a, a whole series of various cases that form a body of case law and then that gets at some point codified into various forms you know all that can still happen without the type of organization that we know of today as as the government or the state so again, so I I have some sympathies for what I would call maybe left anarchists, is which is kind of where I put Matt Clark, Gordon yeah. Matt Clark, and those guys. But I think that we can do a lot better than that as anarchists in understanding the positive things that can come out of removing the state from all of the functions that it involves itself in today. To me, those guys were just like throwing them all out of cocktail, right? <laughs> yeah. And that can get people's attention and it can get people thinking. But when the smoke clears, you need to be able to give people a convincing picture of what the alternative um, looks like and what that could mean for their lives. And so that that's what we're trying to do on our podcast as we look at the built environment. You know, it's about how to uh, how could all this stuff happen um, without relying on government, without taxation, without the kind of zoning regulations that we have today. How can cities develop more organically, um, and more kind of bottom up processes? And when I say organically, I mean, uh, again, those are all market processes. I believe that inform more organic patterns of growth than what we have in kind of zoned, planned developments that we're all familiar with. Yeah, but Tim. Who would build the roads? <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> go ahead. Go I ahead. love, you know, Eric July. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you familiar with him? Yeah. I love his little bit he did on Twitter <laughs> of the, the roads uh, thing. 
That's just like inside joking there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that's um, all we ever do, our libertarians. <laughs> yeah, I know. We're, was, we're don't very entertaining to to ourselves. <laughs> yeah, we're great at ourselves. It's like, oh, you know, every volume that uh, Hoppe or Rothbard wrote or B- Walter Block, it's like, darn, we forgot about the roads. <laughs> 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 right. The whole whole ideology defeated. <laughs> well, I should say, can I comment on that? Yeah, please. <laughs> because, you know, it's become this kind of canard, like, oh, who will build the roads? And it's like this big joke for libertarians because we think that we all we all know the answer to who will build the roads it's like well the roads would get built just like bread gets baked and just like you know shoes get made and just like all these other things happen but i think that's actually an oversimplification and something that we've been a kind of you know theory that joe and i have been trying to develop on our podcast is an understanding of public space within uh, potentially a, a you know a stateless society so again if if the state doesn't own the roads, then who does? And the, the question is, first of all, who, you know, who will build new roads? That's actually not that hard to answer. But the bigger question is, what happens to the existing roads you know, and the, and the sewer systems and, and all this other infrastructure, which are now state-owned, that need to find a home and need to find somebody else to own them? And more importantly, um, what rights would exist to those roads, these public spaces, if they were owned by a private organization as opposed to a government? And so what we've argued, which I think is a little bit different than what what most other libertarians have argued, is that if you take something like a public road, if the lightning bolt hit City Hall tomorrow and everybody said, you know what, we just realized that, you know, we shouldn't be be taxing people to, to pay for these roads and we shouldn't be doing all of the stuff that we're doing. Let's divest ourselves of these roads and and find somebody else to to own them. You can go through a whole number of scenarios of what should they do with the roads? Should they be auctioned off? Should you just allow somebody to come in and, as libertarians would say, to homestead the road? So if somebody comes in and starts actually taking care of the road on their own, then they might acquire some rights over the road. There's all these different kinds of scenarios you can come up with there. We've argued a couple things. The first is that what we see as public roads, and let's, when I say public here now, I'm not talking about government. I'm talking about rights of way where, where anybody has access. If you think about unowned space, right? Just if there's an open field somewhere that nobody owns, somebody walks across it, they don't own that field. You know, walking across it doesn't, isn't homesteading, doesn't grant them ownership of that field, but they do start to create a pattern of use. And if they're walking back and forth every day, and if, if more people are going back and forth, over time, this pathway starts to have a quality where its persistent use of that pathway should be respected. You know, there's no one person who, who may, might own that pathway, but a public access right has been established. And so if somebody then comes in and decides they're, they're going to pave that and start to charge people to use the road, I think there's some justification for charging people to use the improvements on that right of way. But I don't think that person would have the right to evict people from that right of way because it's been it's already been established as a public right of way all right so that so that's my our, my kind of theoretical you know inside libertarianism formulation of this right the public mm-hmm. right to public access on public roads so then the question is with government roads if those became let's say privately owned what should happen we have argued that if government roads are privatized, or we actually don't like the word privatized because it gets confusing when you're talking about public space being privatized, but it's still public. Mm. <laughs> so we use we use the word divest, you know, if they did divest mm. ownership of these things, or we've actually come up with our own word, which is destatalize. <laughs> In other words, you extract the state from ownership and, and management of these things. So what could happen? So for, for one thing, we would suggest that access should still be public. You should still allow public access. That there is an argument for allowing whoever does become the owner um, to charge fees for use of that road, because if people are driving their cars on it, there is going to be maintenance. There's going to be, you know, improvements that need to be made, security that needs to be provided, insurance, adjudication of any of any offenses that happen on the road. So there are expenses with with use of that public way. And so if somebody is taking over ownership of that, they have the right to try to reclaim some of those expenses. But we don't think they would have the right to ultimately evict somebody. There can be other means to get paid, basically. So that's the long answer to who will build the roads. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think it brings in a good a good segue into maybe some things that have influenced myself all through architecture school. And you and your brother would be like Jim's counselor and then spawning into... Uh, uh, you know, 
Chuck Marone of Strong Towns. Hmm, yeah. Where I, you know, right, they've done, I think, pointing out an excellent job about the deficiencies in the current system, right? Like they, I think the, uh, J- James Kunstler's book, you know, the geography of nowhere really paints this picture that, yeah, wow, the suburban experiment, car based development of highways and mass amounts of government owned roads is a huge experiment. And because we've just been, you know, I was born in 94, right? So this is the only world I've known, <laughs> right? So it's, it just becomes like, oh, wait, you actually have to step 10, you have to take, you know, 50 steps back, helicopter view and realize how absurd it is. Hmm. And then someone's like, well, it's not absurd, right? We pay with that through taxes. But then you can really go in and you see people like Chuck Marone, who have finally realized after a 20 year career plus as an engineer that no, they're not actually being paid for by your taxes. They're barely being paid for. If anything, they're still a debt liability and it's just paying down the debt of a different development down the road. Right. So I I think, you know, it's obviously a very deep problem, but there's people that have written well on it. So I think a good thing for like a segue off of this, right? Like with the libertarian aspect, is it something that uh, regardless of people want to buy in, right? To libertarianism Mm -hmm. or, you know, like this movement of de-statalizing is you actually still have to let your state know, right? Your city government know the problem that they're in. Mm -hmm. So Chuck wrote about the growth Ponzi scheme and you guys are lucky enough to interview Chuck, what, like a month ago now? Yeah. It was like in October, two months ago. I just recently re-listened to that. And I think that it was a pretty successful interview. I could see you guys kept Chuck on his toes a little bit there, you know, like you didn't let him, you know, it definitely wasn't like a regurgitated uh, presentation. You guys were actively engaging him in different questions from our point of view, whereas he's still trying to just say like, all right, you know, accepting the main, the status quo, you still have to acknowledge the assets and liabilities that you have. And the unfortunate thing is we consider still roads, you know, assets when they're actually a liability. Infrastructure is a liability. Yeah. I wanted to say one kind of general statement then, and then I'll talk about Strong Towns and, and, and Chuck. The general thought is that these ideas of libertarianism, at least for me, what really kind of engaged me in them initially was the kind of philosophical moral claims, right? That it's wrong for someone to initiate force against somebody else. And therefore, it's also wrong for a group of people to initiate force against somebody else. And so when you look at what government does, taxation, if you don't pay your taxes, eventually they're going to put you in jail. And and if, you know, God forbid you resist that, worse things can happen. So that's uh, for anybody who's listening to these ideas for the first time. That's kind of where we're coming from is that that initial what we call the non-aggression principle is this idea that we look at the initiation of force by anybody as something that's morally wrong. And then we take from there, we say, okay, so from based on that, what can we then understand about our interactions with each other and about an organization called the government, which really differs from every other organization in that it's the only type of organization which is granted legitimate authority to initiate force against people without their consent. And there's a lot we could unpack there, but we, we, we won't go into all yeah. that now. We actually, our, our first three episodes of our podcast, we really kind of yeah. dug into that and spelled it out. So um, I would encourage anyone to check those out if they like. Yeah, that's uh, one thing that I was pointing out to people when we were doing these podcasts is like, there's ways you can spin off and kind of like touch on something. And then I definitely want people to, if they're interested, to refer to those foundation series. You know, I didn't want to like double dip too much into things you guys have already covered. Sure. But I think it's good to like mention it because it does go into, um, you know, I think it informs a lot of this subliminal instincts that strong towns might have, right? Where they realize that the status quo isn't working. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, we start with this kind of philosophical, you know, almost moral idea and statement about how the world should work. But what we find is that kind of serendipitously that when we start to apply that to the way that things are done out in the world, that often we actually get better results from a, let's say, utilitarian standpoint, that that the practical application of these ideas can often produce better results than what is being done under various, you know, forms of of statism and of government actions and government regulations and government subsidies and all this other stuff. And so I think with Strong Towns, you mentioned that we were kind of challenging Chuck a little bit in the interview. And I think that we were, for me, it was, I mean, we, we love Strong Towns. I think Chuck is great. I was able to meet him. The reason we got, we got a chance to interview him is I, I met him at an event 
um, near where I live earlier this year. And we just think they're fantastic. But they're not expressly they're not expressly libertarian. I think in our interview with him, we were trying to to push Chuck a little bit to see if we could see how much of that we could suss out of him. <laughs> it's kind of I think he does have a libertarian streak in him. I know that he has he has studied like the Austrian economists and he has a, a good understanding. I think a pretty good understanding of of libertarian thought. But in general, he he doesn't really promote political views through strong towns. And that's one thing that we we like about talking about issues in the built environment is that oftentimes they're not things that are like left versus right type of issues, right? I mean, there's some stuff like maybe certain things about housing policy that people on the left have have certain things they want to promote and people on the right have other things. And of course, as libertarians, we have our, we have our own approaches. We don't identify specifically with either the right or the left. But what's great about strong towns is that they've kind of come to these, a set of kind of principles, I think, that they understand about what should and shouldn't be done within the built environment. And a lot of it has to do with things that, that the government has done to either restrict or, let's say, mold certain forms of development or patterns of development, primarily through, through zoning regulations and zoning processes. There's also a lot that that happens, you know, through various forms of lending, you know, all the financial systems. And of course, again, the Austrian economists have a lot to say about <laughs> about the way that interest rates are manipulated and, and, and the Federal Reserve and all of the terrible effects that that can cause, you know, the boom bust cycle that that caused in the economy, which is um, exactly what we saw in, in 2008, which some Austrian economists were predicting, you know, a couple of years before that. Um, I actually, what, what little investments I had at the time, I was actually in cash in 2008 when things started going south. <laughs> so just to, to kind of put that out there, that there is an understanding here among the Austrians that, that the financial system as we know it is not what we would call a free market. And of course, that has huge ramifications for, the, for real estate and for the built environment and for development. Um, one of the points that Strong Towns makes is that it's really easy to get new projects to build things. It's really easy to get funding for that, but it's really difficult to get funding for maintenance projects. And so we have the situation where there are all of these incentives out there for both private developers and for local government to grow and grow and grow and expand. But at the same time, that growth is constrained so that it can't happen in traditional, you know, dense city centers where, you know, traditionally you might have a city that reaches a certain level of development. And then when it, when it expands, it'll expand in two ways. It will expand out to some extent, primarily with residential development. And then it will, it will expand inwards by densifying, by going higher, by increasing the, let's say, the intensity of, of certain uses, maybe areas where it's residential, start to get some commercial activity. And in bigger cities, that then starts to happen out in the, in the surrounding areas as well. You can have what might start as suburban areas might have some little pocket that can start to densify and start to get some commercial activity. And then that becomes the center of a new, you know, a new area of development. And so what zoning has done is it's really flattened all of that out. You know, it takes a certain degree of development, let's say within a city center and says, okay, this is enough. You know, we have, we've defined where the city center is, where the commercial stuff is, how much commercial stuff there can be. Maybe there, there's some allowance for growth of some sort in the future, but then everything else around that is residential. Not only is it residential, but it's single family residential. It's what we would call sprawl. I mean, my, the little town that I live in right now, I've been starting to get active in some discussions with the planning board, you know, some hearings and things. And looking at the zoning ordinance in my town, I mean, we have areas that are served by water and sewer, uh, you know, within kind of the small, it's a small town, but, you know, in the small kind of central area where they have a half acre minimum lot size per dwelling unit. So in other words, if you want to build a duplex, you need an acre of land, like in the central area of my city. And that's just for a duplex. I mean, God forbid you want to build a an apartment building or something. Yeah. And so you get the situation where the built environment starts to become very flat, right? You get these defined pockets of let's say commercial development, maybe there's a little bit of mixed use, and then it starts to flatten out everything around it so that when growth happens, it just keeps going out and out and out. And then not only that, but as that growth is expanding, you don't get those little pockets of additional commercial activity that might start to happen within a residential area that's maybe a little bit further out. And so the commercial activity, to some extent, gets constrained to the original core. It gets relegated to you know, the strode um, um, artery, you know, arteries where 
uh, everything is becomes very automobile oriented where there's no walkability. And then, of course, to support all of that, the city then needs to expand roads, to expand pipes, you know, water and sewer. They're expanding power lines. They're expanding their service areas for fire and police, school systems, the school buses. All of that stuff just starts to get spread out in a larger area, but with less and less people per square foot. To me, there are some obvious remedies there <laughs> from a libertarian standpoint. One would be to obviously to look at zoning regulations like this, like I said, you know, this minimum lot size per dwelling unit that just needs to go away. There's some justification for that if you have like a lot with a septic and, and a well on one lot. Yeah, you might need a half acre on that lot for a dwelling unit. But at the same time, you might be able to get a triplex on that lot and have a shared well and, and septic system, you know, on maybe a one acre site. So there are some technical limits to how many dwelling units you, you can have on a site if you're not, especially if you're not served by water and sewer. But those, I think, can be dealt with as the technical limits that they are. I think that if somebody can come up with a way to fit more units on a one acre site, then there shouldn't be some zoning minimum that tells them they can't do that. And then thinking about, obviously, the way that this stuff all gets expanded out in other areas. So for one thing, yeah, take away all these, these zoning restrictions, allow mixed-use development everywhere, allow more dense types of construction everywhere. But then the other side of that, I guess the second point, is that you shouldn't have government just expanding roads and sewers without the developments that it's serving paying for that. I mean, there's this this idea, and, and I should say that when a lot of development happens these days, like let's say someone's building a housing subdivision, usually the road and the pipes that get put in there in that initial phase get put in by that housing subdivision, by by the developer. They're going to build that, and then it's going to be, there are a couple ways that that can happen. They either create a, let's say a homeowners association, uh, essentially a trust that owns the common areas within that development, and then they take over ownership of the sewer system and of the uh, of the roads and everything else within their development. But then the other thing that can happen is that those roads and sewers get turned over to the town and become public roads and public sewers that are now being subsidized by all of the taxpayers in the town. So the initial construction may have been paid for, but... And here's getting back to the strong towns idea, you know, in, in that second round of, of maintenance, you know, 25 years down the road, when the road needs to be re replaced, when it needs to be resurfaced, when the, the sewer pipes need to be maintained, all of that cost now falls onto a base of taxpayers, which is strong towns points out, let's say it's a single family, you know, cul-de-sac development will never in its lifetime generate enough property taxes to support even the basic infrastructure that's serving that development. And so for us, the solution is to, you know, even stopping short of, let's say, taking the roads away from government ownership, at least start pricing the roads in a way that the people who are using the roads are paying for the roads and other utilities that they're using. This doesn't necessarily mean that you have a toll like at every intersection, but you could think of a number of ways that you could be paying essentially fees for use of various types of infrastructure. And then that can become self-supporting. And if that's the case, then it's going to change the the incentives for governments to expand all these roads and pipes and everything else um, in the first place. So that if a road expansion, the utility expansion needs to be funded by the actual, let's say, users and people who are paying for it, who are willing to pay for it and who find value in it, then I think that's going to change, for one thing, the extents of these systems, you know, the extents of the roads and the extents of the utility systems. Um, but I think it will also change the density equation because when all of a sudden everybody's actually paying for that mile of road out in front of their house, there's a lot stronger incentive for them to have more houses along that mile of road who can share in the cost of funding that infrastructure. I think that if you start to do that, that you're going to start to see even just that simple step of just pricing things for what they cost um, to the users. And that can be done well while everything is, is under government ownership. I think that that can start to change the thinking about what should be built and where and who should be paying for it. Yeah, I think that's an important aspect that I've been trying to tackle in my own thesis project. And so I know we talked, you know, a little while ago, we got to introduce each other for the first time. I had reached out to you about the thesis. And what it's really boiled down to now is I was just looking, you know, I explained this growth, you know, the big bet system, right, that we kind of use, uh, you know, anticipating future growth. 
And this is like the nature of how we do government here in the United States is it's short term, right? You know, mayors will serve a four year term. City boards might serve like a, you know, a split two year term or something like that if they are allowed to be elected in some, you know, sometimes it's like an appointed position depending on the municipality. I know in my hometown of Zion, uh, you know, like the boards kind of rotate around and whatnot. And then the mayor is a four year thing, but you know, it's short term. There's no incentive to look at, okay, how are we going to now pay for what we just built? It's saying, all right, Hey, look, community, we just built this uh, baseball stadium. Isn't this awesome? You know, we're doing a good job. We got a, a new baseball stadium, but no one ever asked, Oh, do you even own the road where you built that? Or like, do you even own the land? You know, like there's no like foresight where you get with private investment, where you want to ensure, like, can I afford my house? Can I afford what I've just purchased? Can I afford uh, this new re- you know, investment, this new commercial property? So I think there's, um, you know, just pointing out the pricing of things is really important. And so what I've kind of zeroed in on is parking, you know, and looking hmm. at how the parking space is a standard metric, right? Like if the engineers have been doing what they've been supposed to be doing, inspecting them to the standard lot size, there's actually acres, acres of land available that is underutilized. And so I think this is one of those metrics maybe spinning into what Chuck talks about with like that value per acre and something that I think even the libertarians might not fully grasp, you know, what they're asking for, right? Like some people in our movement, either it be like, you know, more mainstream party libertarians or people on our side, the anarcho-capitalists, they just don't understand the drastic situation the built environment is with this horizontal spread right? There's a lot of costs associated with maintaining this stuff. And so things are, would be drastically different. So maybe one that we could discuss is like, you know, looking at like the big box, right? Like this value per acre metric, like, well, of course, you know, like your mainstream approach is like the big box is, is perfect for local economy because it houses more product for the local economy. Prices are a little bit lower. And so it houses everything you need in one location. And then if it doesn't, if it's not at the Walmart or the Target store, well, you just drive down to the next lot, which is the Home Depot, and you get what you need there. This type of development is clearly market approached, right? Because people are uh, buying what they want, but there's an, I think there's an inherent flaw in that, you know, that is either reflected in the value per acre metric or the hidden subsidies. Yeah. I mean, I think that I'll say off the bat that I'm not as as dark on big box development per se, as some people are, but, you know, just, just as, as kind of an, like a, a, an aesthetic, like, oh, you know, Walmart is evil, that, that, that kind of stuff. I mean, yeah. I have my, you know, I, I don't go to Walmart much and I know that there are, you know, I think there are some fair arguments there, but it's not something that, that I, that I, I worry a lot about. But I do think that, as you said, that what makes these type, this type of big box development possible is that these cities are providing all kinds of, of subsidies to bring these things in, whether they're kind of explicit or implicit. I think when we were talking to Chuck, he mentioned this project he had done at one point as an engineer. You know, it was for, for Home Depot. He said it was, you know, the building was, was super cheap for them to put the building up. But then that it was, let's say it was like a million dollar building that Home Depot was building. But the cost of the infrastructure that the town was extending out to that building was like a million dollars, <laughs> you know, and that was a town expense. And the town wanted to do that because, look, we're bringing Home Depot into our town and this is the thing that's going to that's going to save our town. It's going to generate jobs and it's going to generate economic activity and, and all of this stuff. And I think that that does become a rationale for cities to be like seeking out that kind of development. But really, you know, I, I think the big box phenomenon it's really just the it's the end result of of everything we were, I was just talking about where between the let's say zoning requirements you mentioned parking all these off street parking requirements when you have the situation where everything just gets more and more and more spread out then everybody has to have a car you know if, if you're going anywhere you're getting in your car so you might as well go to some place where it's convenient to park your car where you can go in and get everything you need and get back into your car and bring it home you know which is very different than let's say maybe a European model. And of course, they have some of this in Europe as well now too. But let's say that that traditional European model, where again, as we spend time traveling, we a lot of places we stayed, we didn't have a car. We were staying in some cities and we would just walk out pretty much every day. You go to the grocery store and you get a little bit of what you need for dinner that night and you come back. And that's kind of how you manage your day and how you get the things that you need is you're just you know, you're on foot, you're walking around. Uh, for me, I was always dragging two kids behind me <laughs> um, as, we're, as I'm hauling, you know, hauling groceries home on foot. It's always fun. And so, you know, this kind of thing can be done, but in the kind of development 
that has been subsidized and regulated into existence here in, in, in America, that, that suburban experiment, as you said, that becomes impossible. I mean, there's if you do live in a place where you can walk within, I don't know, half a mile of your house and get everything you need for your groceries and everything else, you're probably paying a lot in, in rent or you know, you're probably living in, in some apartment in a center city area. We just don't build things that way anymore. And, you know, part of that, I, I'm putting a lot of this on the, the regulations and the subsidies. To some extent, I think that a more automobile-oriented pattern of development was probably inevitable in the 20th century. Once the car was invented, and again, I, I'm someone who's not necessarily as, as dark on, on automobiles as some people in the, <laughs> in the urbanist. Yeah, James Kunstler. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Like, 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 I, I like James, Jim Kunstler, but some of that stuff, I just don't go as far down that road as him. Um, I think that, that automobiles have done a lot for advancing individual freedom, let's say, individual liberty, for allowing people to access more opportunities, more economic opportunities. And th I guess that, that is what it is. You know, the, so automobiles, they're, they're here to stay. Um, they do have some benefits. There are some problems associated with them. But I think there was still an opportunity to have a more of a traditional development pattern in a lot of places where that's just, that was really just made impossible. I guess my, my note of optimism here is that I think it's still possible to bring that back over time. I think that if we start to get rid of, if we start to get rid of all of these single family zoning type of requirements, if we start to price roads and infrastructure and services appropriately for, uh, based on, on who's actually using them, I think that that can start to create a set of in incentives within the built environment where you can start to have value discovery in places where, where some of these things don't exist right now. So I think you can start to have some neighborhood where maybe somebody opens up a, a barbershop out of their house, right? <laughs> and then maybe that becomes successful and then they start to build the front of their house, you know, out to the street. And now they have a little shop front out in front of their house. Maybe a couple of the neighbors do the same thing. You know, somebody comes in and, and puts in a little cafe. Someone else comes in and they, they open up a little convenience store, some kind of little shop. Maybe the neighborhood starts to grow in value. They decide they're going to start to, to make their residential buildings a little bit bigger. Maybe they start to densify. You know, they, they take if there's a gap between two buildings and maybe they infill that with another building. That's somebody else's house. Maybe the buildings start to get built up into, you know, two or three floor apartment buildings. Now you have shops kind of out to the front of the building coming out to the street. Over time, maybe some of those get replaced with maybe brick buildings. You know, maybe they're, <laughs> maybe the, the older residential buildings aren't quite cutting in and they have, they're able to support more dense occupancy there. They start to do more and more permanent buildings. And this densification starts to happen all up and down the street. You start to have much more mixed use development. You start to have businesses along the street front. You start to have walkability between different amenities. And, you know, at the end of the day, you end up with something that looks like Somerville, Massachusetts, which is uh, where, where I used to live. And if you drive around the streets of Somerville, uh, you actually can see this pattern in the way that it's been developed. You have these kind of main street areas where you look and there, there are some, some, you know, shop fronts lined up along the street, maybe some little like one story brick storefronts lined up along, let's say, Broadway in, in Somerville. And then you look behind them and there's like a gable end, you know, triple decker wood framed apartment building that at one time was probably a house and at some point got converted into apartments. And then they built a shop front out to the front. And you can kind of see this history of how these neighborhoods became these dense, mixed use, walkable places, which, of course, all the new urbanists <laughs> are, are trying to build from scratch, right? I think that that kind of thing has happened in the past. I think that it, it's a natural kind of way for the, the built environment to be developed. And I think it's something that should be allowed in the future. Um, and if it is, I think that, I think that it's possible to start to get back to more of a traditional pattern of development in more places than we could even imagine having them now. Yeah. I think this is something I always get. One of my thesis uh, committee advisors, uh, his name's Brian Shermer. He always says like, and I think recently he started to realize, he's like, oh, yeah, you're going for like this nostalgia thing. And I'm like, <laughs> no, like I'm not nostalgic <laughs> for a past that I never lived in. Yeah. Right. Like, again, I always remind him, I'm like, Brian, I was born in 1994. Like, I don't have a nostalgia for any of this. You know, I have a nostalgia, if anything, maybe of like a different civic nature. Right. You know, where maybe we would solve our problems as human beings and not try to push it off to a government. Right. To solve the problems. 
maybe that's what I'm nostalgic for. But I think in the built environment and as an architect and someone who looks around and sees, I have seen friends, you know, go from school to the workforce. And then uh, even some of my coworkers at the current firm I'm at, where it's like, okay, you can see they've just kind of like accepted the jive of day to day. They might not be totally happy with what they're designing, uh, but, you know, they need a paycheck, right? And so they're just going to do what the work that comes across. And I'm seeing, well, wait a minute, like traditional development patterns provided immense opportunity, right? Like there was so much to be done. Uh, you know, to maintain these buildings, to uh, uh, adapt, right? This is like a word that I think is just lost from like American development patterns, right? Everything is built to a finished state, you know, set so much in zoning code. It's like you look at a traditional sprawled uh, suburb development, you know, and the buildings have that weird gap between them, right? You know, maybe it's like uh, 50 feet between each, you know, where you would have your picket fence running between them. The initial design is so constrained that the problem solving of trying to, you know, how can this thing adapt? And you look at it, you know, like that suburb can adapt. There is no adaptability built into its un- unit of, of development. You know, so like watt size is really important. So I didn't get a chance to send you uh, what I was developing, but maybe I think, you know, it was like a thought experiment of like using the parking metric, right? This one parking stall. Mm-hmm is an idea of, uh, you know, I've had two reactions to it where I'm building using temporary building solutions to build, you know, uh, small business structures on them. Right. So instead of like permanent foundations, it's ground screws, you know, and you Mm -hmm. just build a structure off there. And then that gives me a win win because temporary buildings can't be taxed and can't be overly (laughs) regulated in current codes. And then the opportunity is to have the discussion where I'm saying, look at, you know, we've restricted to where business can take place, but look at all this wasted infrastructure that's costing us a lot of money. But I think that typology shows, at least in, in a diagrammatic way, that you can incrementally expand them and infill them. And then eventually they go from being temporary structures to permanent structures. And so I think you've had a much longer career in architecture. Do you think there's a, a way we can get back to this incrementalism and the way we build and not so much the fact that everything has to be built to a finished state? You know, it's going to be 20,000 square feet, you know, from day one. Do you think that's like a more of a cultural thing or a development mindset? So here, here's how I think about it. This idea of, of nostalgia, that this is like a, a nostalgic idea. I mean, I think there's some truth to that, that this was something that that was done a lot more you know, 100 years ago, obviously before the automobile. But I don't think you have to look back that far to find examples of this. You know, I mentioned some of the traveling I had done, and we stayed in places like the Dominican Republic and Panama. I'm thinking particularly in Panama, we stayed in, uh, we were in Panama City, we were in this, this rural area, we got this little Airbnb kind of near this beach area that was fairly underdeveloped. And you can, <laughs> you've, I don't know if you've listened to our episode, I think it was episode 20, where I talked about this place we stayed where, um, let's say that we went a few days without uh, running water in our <laughs> in our rental unit. Um, I'll, I'll leave people to to check out the episode to, to get that whole story. It's been a while since I listened to that one. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. But point being that this that this was this was a pretty at least by American standards it was it was a fairly poor area. Um, it was a you know it was, it was a rural farming area. There was a lot of of ranching around there. We actually you know at times would have to stop the car to let a, a heard a cattle pass us by on the road. <laughs> and there was a little town there near where we stayed where it's, you know, of course, where we go to get our to get our groceries and food. And and if you look at the way that people get by in a place like that, obviously, there are there are some some shops and, and things, you know, there is a, a built infrastructure of buildings with shops and with residential places and, and everything else. But the other thing that you see is that you see a lot of informal types of building essentially i mean there's you know there's maybe like one kind of american style grocery store and then out in the parking lot in front of the grocery store you'll have people sitting there and selling fruit and vegetables you know they'll be selling farm products across the street you might have just a little like a little stick built lean to that somebody has turned into into a farm stand and who knows if if they actually own that space or not or if it's just kind of unowned public space that they've just just put up a little shack on and and that's where they sell their watermelons. There were other people who would just park their pickup truck at the sidewalk and sell watermelons out of the back of the, of the pickup truck. We had a lot of watermelons when we were there. <laughs> and then you would see like even the sidewalks, there would be some areas where people would build little structures just from 
let's say from the curb back to a building. So if you imagine like an awning on a building that would come out, but then they'd enclose the other side of that. And then you'd have these stalls of of little vendors who are selling all, all kinds of stuff, little toys, you know, selling clothes, selling food of various sorts. These very informal, very low cost types of construction that for each of those people created created their means of survival, you know, created their means of income. And it also brought um, services to the town that other people needed. They were selling things that people wanted to buy there. So we've come up with this term, um, sidewalk entrepreneurship, for, <laughs> for this kind of thing. And actually, my favorite example of this was when we were in the Dominican Republic, again, kind of out in front of the grocery store. And you're walking down the sidewalk, and there's a guy sitting on like a five-gallon bucket, right? And he's holding a shrimp up in the air, just kind of, you know, for everybody to see, just dangling the shrimp. And, you know, if you decide you want to buy some shrimp, you stop and talk to the guy. He gets off the bucket, opens the top. The bucket's full of ice with a bunch of shrimp in it. And he just pulls out, you know, a dozen shrimp or whatever for you and puts it in a plastic bag, hands you your shrimp, you pay him and you move on. So this guy's entire business was a five-gallon bucket on the sidewalk that he's sitting on, you know, and his, his, his whole entire marketing budget was just him holding the shrimp up in the air. And so this is a, a very low cost way for somebody to start some kind of a business. And in poorer parts of the world, uh, this is a big part of the way that people get by, I think, is that they're able to, for one thing, um, utilize public space so they don't necessarily need to own or rent land in order to start a business, to sell products. They don't take up much space. You know, they're not building anything permanent. If, if they have anything built there, it's these very informal types of, of structures. But that's all they really need, at least to get something started. And then, you know, maybe if they're successful at that, maybe if this guy's, you know, selling shrimp by the bucket, um, eventually maybe he can afford to rent one of the storefronts in that town and then somebody else can go sit on a bucket and sell something else. Um, and so I think that thinking about these kinds of, you know, very small incremental types of enterprises could be really helpful for people in cities. Obviously, it's helpful for people in some of these other places around the world. I mean, in fact, I think that's how most of the people in the world get by is with these types of um, these types of endeavors. And in America, you, you can't imagine anybody doing any of that stuff on any public street or public sidewalk, right? I mean, if a guy, you can imagine if a guy was just like sitting on a bucket of ice, like selling, trying to sh sell shrimp well, to people. There was a good, good uh, story I saw on, uh, I think I just saw it on Twitter, but it was a woman in New York who was selling uh, like empanadas mm -hmm. uh, to people at a, at a train stop. And the police violently arrested her. <laughs> like they they threw her into a wall and she's speaking Spanish. Uh -huh. And the police officer is just yelling at her. And he's like, I know you speak English. I know you speak English. And this, you know, Hispanic woman is just like confused because <laughs> I'm assuming in her culture where she came from, you know, selling empanadas to people as they're on their way to and from other things is normal. Yeah, of course. I, you know, maybe that's an extreme, but I know uh, locally in Zion, I'd met with the economic developer there, and she's a very open-minded person. I hope to work with her more hmm. post-thesis. But she was explaining to me the problem they had is just education. So people, and I explained to her that it's a greater problem than education. But anyway, the story was, uh, you know, these two guys wanted to open uh, like soul food, you know, like the best black mm -hmm. people food that exists in, you know, African-American culture. And these guys were you know, born and raised in Zion, uh, wanted to buy this building and open, you know, this soul food restaurant. And I was like, wow, that's a great thing for this community, you know, mm -hmm. to have this like good story, you know, this perfect small bottom up success story. The problem was, is in the state of Illinois, to do anything commercially, you need to be a licensed contractor, mm -hmm. which costs a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's not cheap. It's not like just going to say, hey, like, can I get us like in Wisconsin? It's relatively easy to become a state contractor. It's like reasonable fees, reasonable submitting proof that you know what you're doing type thing. Illinois, it's a lot more complicated. And then they also need to have the building approved, having like a, you know, someone from the state come in and check the building, which has a fee associated with it. And then since the building had been sitting vacant for six months, there's a rule in the state law that says it needs to be brought up to modern ADA code. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The building, I checked the building tax records. The building was built in 1930. Mm -hmm. There was no modern ADA code in 1930. Right. Uh, so these guys, I think, had uh, an upstart cost of, you know, like 20 grand, you know, $20,000. Mm -hmm. But almost all of their budget would have been consumed in fees. 
yeah. right? Just paying the fees. So they didn't have any money to do the ADA bathroom, to do anything. So I proposed just off the cuff with her, why don't you do a rolling deadline? Uh-huh. You know, like, why don't you allow that business to open? Yeah. And allow them time to accure capital, right? Because we don't even know mm. if the, the business is going to be successful. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that's a little bit of what I'm doing with my thesis is trying to lower that barrier of entry for these more impromptu entrepreneurial things. Cause I really looked at it. I was like, is what I'm doing feasible, right? Is like providing like this platform for people to purchase a low cost, essentially shack, right? You know, if you kind of think the strong towns, the Muskegon, Michigan, they did this, you know, the city built these little mini sheds, essentially, you know, they call them shatlets or whatever. <laughs> You know, and they allow people to open up small business in them. And some of them have been so successful that people went and bought a commercial front property. And I was looking at it and I was like, man, in so many small towns, you're talking about tens of thousands of dollars just to afford the back taxes on the property to even start to consider purchasing the empty storefront. Yeah. There's so many things that they do to restrict an individual for starting their sidewalk entrepreneurship. But if a big developer comes in and says, Hey, we see you got a lot of empty land near the highway exit. Can we build this, you know, development? It almost seems like cities are incentivized to, you know, do whatever it takes to get that development, right? Like, you know, Amazon shops around for the lowest (sighs) taxes or whatever. So I think when you're talking about like, Hey, this guy made a business by selling shrimp on the road, there's like a certain standard that people are afraid of. But I think they forget to realize that. You're not saying, let's take the guy who's selling shrimp in the Dominican Republic and bring him here. You're saying your neighbor might have a business that they like and Mm -hmm. they would like to start it. So it's, I think that's a little bit of the fear that I've been trying to talk with community people is getting over it. Like having your neighbor start a business isn't going to drastically change your built environment, right? Like, like it's not like you're all of a sudden going to have, you know, like bums on the street wandering around and selling things. It's like we're just trying to provide a way to have a local economy. Yeah. And I think there are some things going on nowadays where where these things are starting to be appreciated. Let's say I'm thinking like like in my town here, there's a little our little down. We have a nice little small, but but really nice little downtown area. And there's like this one row of buildings that's kind of offices and shops on the lower level. And behind it, there's a little bit of parking and a row of garages. This was, you know, this is an old I don't know how old the building is, but probably at least 100 years old. And these old garages behind the building. When some guy has come in and he's taken over two of the garage bays and he runs a bike shop out of it. And so he's he's fixing people's bikes. He's selling bikes out of these these little just garage bays in the, this parking lot behind <laughs> behind this other building. And so I, I love seeing stuff like that. In any town, you can go around and find some little example like that where somebody's found some kind of forgotten space and found a way to make a use out of it. And then the other example is the, I don't know what it's like out where you are, but around um, New England, and I think a lot of cities, it's been this explosion in food trucks, which is really a, a, along the same lines as everything we've been talking about here, that it's it's a low cost way for somebody to get a business up and running. And in fact, as I mentioned, when I lived down in Somerville, we live um, up the street from, the, there's this one business that started as a food truck and they actually opened up a, a shop front kind of near where we were they were selling so much stuff out of the food truck that they needed more space to prepare all the food that they would then sell out of the food truck, essentially. So they opened the shop front. That became really their commercial kitchen. Um, and then they, they were able to, you know, you could go and buy, go get a sandwich or whatever from the, the storefront. But then that was also supporting their food truck business. And then I think they did catering and some other things, too. So, again, that, it's this example of how you let people start with something small, like just parking a food truck in a city parking spot. And then they can start to build that wealth. I, your, I think your idea w- was great with the restaurant in your town of, of allowing them kind of a rolling, a rolling start on um, making some of the improvements. Although I will say with the ADA, that's a challenging thing because it's, it's a federal, <laughs> yeah, a federal regulation, but you know, it's a great idea. Yeah. I was saying with the ADA, like I understand it's a federal regulation, but you know, they still require a lot of local participation to enforce this. Well, the problem, not, not that it's a problem, and I think they're, you know, but, but but the issue with the ADA is that if someone were to build something that wasn't built to the ADA standards that they were required to, then basically somebody could sue them. So they would be at risk yeah. of whether or not the town enforce anything. Somebody could come in and say, you're not providing 
accessibility to your building. Yeah. That's discrimination. And then, you know, they've got a whole bunch of problems on there. Lots, yes. lots of problems. I think the problem with it too is, you know, I, I had like a little impromptu, like city community meeting with like five people that were interested in hearing what I had to say. And I made it pri- like a, it just at a, a coffee shop in Zion. And I think what they got was, is there's good and bad intentions, right? Like you can have like the outside developer who gets special treatment from the city, but then it's like, I don't think those two guys are trying to reopen that building to like discriminate against someone with a ADA accessible wheelchair, right? Like their intention isn't to say, we don't want you here, but you know, the code has done everything it can to make it as incredibly difficult for them to even open. It's like a thing where, yes, they can be sued. And is there a way for the city to post saying like, you know, and she had this idea. It's like, hey, well, we could post something saying like their ADA is in review. Yeah. And that way the city has huh. kind of come in as a shield a little bit. Yeah, that that could be. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah, you're right. I mean, I'm sure there's, there's probably some way that they could sort that out. But I guess my, my point is that some of these things aren't just the city's like decision to make, unfortunately. Yeah. When it comes to something like that. But um, but yeah, I mean, you know, the, again, this idea of trying to remove all of these artificial costs from the very smallest types of businesses from starting. Right. I mean, you can you can put any kind of if you want to regulate Walmart. Right. You can put any kind of regulations out there to, to manage, you know, retail and manage businesses and manage parking and whatever else. Right. And Walmart's going to take that in stride. Like, you know, that, that's not going to be a problem for Walmart. In fact, what you often see is you'll see like big corporations will actually be in support of various types of restrictions on their own industry. Yeah. Walmart loves a $15 minimal wage fight. Right. Because it makes yeah. it so much harder for any competitors to come up and to come up and compete with them. But in the meantime, of course, that just kills the ability of, of anybody much lower down on, the, on those economic rungs to just get a get a foot on the ladder and start building something, you know, however small they're starting. Yeah, that is um, something that I've been constantly trying to tackle. You know, there's different fears associated with some of this stuff. You know, I know you just did your great episode on the 11 fears of uh, uh, renting. <laughs> Short-term rentals, yeah, yeah. Short-term renting. Uh, I think I might have to do uh, maybe like a spinoff of like fears of, uh, you know, like the food truck stuff. Yeah. But they're incredibly profitable. I looked at a blog. A guy had in um, Minneapolis bought five of those like beer cart things, you know, where people bike on them and like they do like the party. Have you seen those at all? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're really popular in Wisconsin <laughs> and Chicago and stuff, uh, you know, where you, you see, I see them even on the river. He said he only cost him like $125 in maintenance a month. <laughs> and so since everything is paid by the end users, you know, they pay for the alcohol and they pay for the food. Uh-huh. And then he has his five people that go on the thing and they get paid to by the end user, right? By the people. Right. At the end, he makes like a million dollars a year from these like five (laughs) bike carts. Wow. And I'm saying, all right, well, that you know, they're literally nine by 18, the overall dimension, like the bounding Mm -hmm. box, they're the size of a parking lot. So I was like, I did the quick value per acre thing, right? I was like, if he's, if his business is worth a million (laughs) dollars, you know, I'll put that in as the building cost. Right. And right. then the acre is, you know, like a parking lot is like 0. 0.00001 of an acre. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, the value is like astronomical, right? Yeah, like you're yeah. generating a lots of economic return on some of these things. I think our discussion and our perspective as architects has a lot to offer just regular people that are looking, that are maybe unsatisfied from the daily life, right. Of getting up and commuting to work, and wondering, you know, why the area they live is in, you know, different states of disrepair, right? Like you were saying, like, there's, it's hard to maintain things. But I think we also provide something really interesting to, like, the libertarian argument. You know, like, I think there's a lot that, a lot of insight that we might have to the discussion that someone, maybe like a Tom Woods, might not naturally have. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if you have anything to comment on that, with like, some of this different insight that we have as architects. Yeah, we, I mean, that's, I think, part of the reason that we wanted to start our our podcast and talk about, you know, as we call it, the, the built environment of a stateless society is that we're trying to, I guess, do two things or kind of speak to two audiences. One is to try to introduce libertarian ideas to people who are involved in the development of the built environment. And then the second is to bring ideas of, of urbanism. And of course, now that we've found all the strong town stuff, they have, they have a lot of really strong kind of pragmatic arguments that we're trying to bring to the libertarian community so that people get interested in these ideas and realize that there are 
let's say, libertarian arguments for the way that things can be done in the built environment and that these are things that actually can affect them, you know, where they live in their towns and actually things that they can get involved in in a way that isn't just like left, right political bickering, right? I mean, anybody can go down to, and I actually encourage anybody to just go to a, go to a planning board hearing in their town and listen to the issues that come up, listen to the concerns that people have, listen to the way that they get addressed, and think about whether or not this is actually a, let's say, productive process. I mean, for me, it's like, it's, I think one reason why I mean, there's lots of reasons why people aren't really open to the ideas of libertarianism. But one of it is that people have never, a lot of people have never experienced any kind of, you know, what you might call oppression, uh, you know, to use kind of, kind of an extreme word, um, from the state, right? I mean, yes, they have to pay their taxes and, you know, yes, they have to put on their seatbelt when they get in the car and, and um, you know, maybe they got pulled over for a parking ticket or here or there or, or for speeding. But by and large, uh, most people don't view the state and view government as something that is restricting the way that they live their lives. But then they go to the town and say that they want to build, let's say, a a one-bedroom addition on the side of their house. And the town says, well, if you do that, then that new addition you're building is going to be 15 feet from your side lot line. And they say, okay, well, so what? And the, the town says, well, it needs to be t- at least 20 feet from the side lawn line. We have a side yard setback of 20 feet. And if you, if you build that there, you know, that's illegal. So no, you cannot build this, this one bedroom addition onto your house. And I think for some people, that's kind of this wake up call that they don't actually own their property, at least not to the extent that they think they do, that they can't, you know, use their property the way that they want to. And that the state is really restricting those rights for dubious reasons, <laughs> I'll say. So I think that getting involved in in some local discussions about zoning and even particular projects that are maybe being proposed in a certain town, these are things that are worth paying attention to. They're things that can really get you engaged in conversations with, with people in your town that, again, get you away from the left-right paradigm and get you into really just talking about the issues and talking about what's right or wrong and why these zoning restrictions exist what good they're doing, or what problems they're creating. And I think that's a way for people like me, the libertarians, to start to bring um, some different ideas to discussions and and ways of thinking that really haven't been challenged um, in a very long time in a lot of these towns. Yeah, I think uh, I can definitely see that sentiment brewing. I get a chance to work with the, the village, the local village in my town that I grew up in next to Zion. Their economic developer wants to turn over this plot of land that they own to market development. And then he's also in contact with the state of Illinois since they own all the roads. He wants to repave the main road, which is a strode, down to single lane. Okay, yeah. So when I was growing up in high school, they repaved what's called Sheridan Road to a two lane, you know, strode situation. Uh-huh. And at the time everyone's like, Oh, Hey, you know, Sheridan's being paved. This is great. But then I see what it's done to the city uh, over time. And it's basically just incentivized these like a uh, fast paced development. So there was this ugly, you know, dollar store that was thrown up on one corner and there was really no sense of bringing things back to the street level. Right. It just it's further incentivized, you know, all right, well now uh, my commute time is, Getting from downtown Zion, you know, where I live in my residential suburb is now a little bit faster to get to the highway, right? right? So I can get to the supermarket development faster. So it basically, I think it did is it just muted any conversation about local place, right? And so I think both economic developers are toying with the idea of making the state in 2020 repave it back down to single lane with street parking. And then the caveat now is then the city, if they do that, the state says, all right, well, you're going to have to own the road now. Uh huh. You know, the municipality will have to own it. Oh, I see. I'm sorry. So this is a state road that now, if they're doing this chain, now the city's got, okay, I got it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And so I was, I made the point and I, under, I said, I know you're a small, you know, village. And then the city of Zion is relatively larger, right? 30,000 people, roughly. I said, well, all right, well, you can lower the speed. You know, there's other ways of financing it, right? You could do maybe, I said, don't, get your uh, small police department of like two guys to start writing parking tickets. Just say there's like a fee, right? Like a part, like a universal uh, village-wide parking fee 
you know, make it like 20 bucks a year or whatever. <laughs> and everyone just buys that. So now you can go and park, right? You don't have to worry about a meter or anything like that. It's mm-hmm. just been paid for as a kind of like a service, right? You were talking to Titus uh, recently. Oh yeah. Uh, Titus Gable. Yeah. Gable. Yeah. All right. About this, like creating the city as a, uh, as a market product. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I was, in, I was pushing both of them in this direction. I said, if you start to think about it as what services you're providing and having a real tangible return, you know, people will naturally want to be involved again because they'll see, oh, wow. Like, Hey, the city's like responding. Like if like I, I made the point to a uh, design economic developer, I said, if you went into a neighborhood and fixed every street tree, every sidewalk, and every uh, light, right? In just those three things, which is relatively cheap compared to the, you know, the multi-million dollar investments they tried to do in a baseball stadium that failed, and a nuclear power plant that failed, hmm. and two shopping centers that failed, and an empty business district, right? They tried to make a, a business park uh-huh. yep. completely empty. I said pennies on the dollar compared to those investments. The people walking out of their home would all of a sudden have confidence in their city again. They're like, hey. The sidewalk was fixed. Right. You know, and I was like, but actually fix it. Like, don't, you know, what Milwaukee just did in where I live is they tore up the sidewalk in front of like a corner business that I walk past every day to get to school. And now that it's inclement weather, they just threw tarps over it yeah. and like their construction signs. And they're probably not going to come back and finish fixing that until the end of the winter now. <laughs> right. Like, right. so there's like a, there's like this uh, thing where I was telling her, I was like, if you could get the mayor and the board on, on, on this idea of doing the small bet as a city and showing true return on the taxes that people are paying to the city, you know, cause I actually, I'm the nerd that went on the, you know, the Lake County you know, dot gov website and clicked on the tax parcels, right? Oh, yeah. You know, I clicked on almost every single one in the areas that I'm focusing on. I'm like, I see what people are paying. You know, I see that there's money going into the city. You know, I calculated the percentages of people. I was like, well, you need to start showing that you're doing something with that money other than just paying back, uh, you know, essentially debt, right? Like mm-hmm. there has to be, you're not going to dig yourself out of this hole unless improvements are made that start to spur this type of um, sidewalk entrepreneurship, mm-hmm. right? Like, you know, I think um, there's a good argument that we're making where you're saying we start to engage a market economy again at a local level, a lot of the problems will self-correct. This is now kind of the, to the extent that it can be pragmatic, the pragmatic argument for divesting infrastructure from, from government ownership, right? Because all of that tax money that government is collecting from local properties, that's not just going to the infrastructure, right? That's going into a big pot where infrastructure is competing with schools and with police and with debt service and with pensions and all these other messes governments have created in all the other sectors that they've taken over. And so, you know, it might be that we can't fix that sidewalk this year because we have to hire a new teacher, right? Or that, you know, we can't... Um, do the upgrade on the sewage digester at the sewage treatment plant because we have to uh, to pay down this debt on this baseball stadium that we built you know 20 years ago that that is now failing as you said it's empty <laughs> <laughs> so so i mean there's a problem with any organization when you start to pool all these resources together um, and have them have these very disparate types of enterprises competing with each other for funding with a very limited source of of income and, and a source of income that's not related to the actual productive capacity or the actual the actual value that those things are producing. And so if you can start to take that road that's out in front of that development, take that away from the city and allow it to be, you know, allow somebody to own it and allow people to maybe charge people to, something to drive on it to at least pay for some of the improvements, as you said, to pay for parking. Maybe some of the businesses that would come in there pay into some kind of a, essentially like a you know, like a condominium fee, like a homeowners association type of fee that helps to support some of the public infrastructure within that development. And these things do happen. I mean, these happens all the time in in private developments where where essentially they're condominiumized and you have privately built roads, privately built infrastructure that is paid for through some kind of a of a trust or some kind of a of an association where the property owners in that area are paying fees into it. So this is not like a a radical libertarian idea for people to pay for, you know, the things that they use in the developments where they live and where they own um, the property. So if you can start to take those things away from from government, 
And now they're no longer competing with all these other aspirations that government has with the limited amount of funds that it has. And they can start to become, hopefully, self-sustaining. Now, the problem is that the way things have been built to this point, they're not sustainable. As we said before, you know, a lot of these roads just don't have enough homes on them where the property taxes that they're collecting from these homes will never pay for even like one round of maintenance for the road in the lifetime before it has to do the next round of maintenance. And this, this is obviously the strong town's argument. I've read something where Chuck has said that the infrastructure budget in any given town is maybe between like 10% to 15% of the total budget. So even if you look at, at all these taxes that various properties are paying into it, only 10 to 15% of that is actually going to the infrastructure. And so infrastructure is really losing out by being owned by government. And as we said before, it gets you this result where because it doesn't need to be productive, that it gets expanded beyond um, any kind of sustainable extents. And then it becomes just about impossible to pay to sustain it, to pay to keep maintaining it over time based on the type of development that happens where the development isn't necessarily in demand. Yeah, I think that's something that is hard for some people to rationalize even if you can show them the numbers of the drawings, you know, I found in the tax code for Zion that, uh, you know, the actual percentages of what's going to which. And so there's like a township fund and a city fund, and then there's a separate school funds, you know, and I was starting to see how much money the schools were getting from each of these small businesses uh, and properties in the city. And then at the same time, you know, I'm active in multiple Zion community Facebook groups and uh, when I was there, the high school district was on the verge of being taken over by the state hmm. for poor performance, right? So this was, I graduated in 2013. Now it's so bad that they have had mass exodus, like where teachers are like, no more. And they've just walked off the job. Hmm. Um, and so uh, there was like a, you know, a public thing where the dist superintendent and the district boards were like, don't worry, you know, community of Zion, we will have fully accredited and licensed teachers, you know, ready for the school year. But there's someone who's keeping track of all the faculty that's left, you know, now that the school system is just evolving into chaos, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, I mean, I, I feel very bad for the students and, and, the, fa and the teachers, honestly. I mean, I've had a, a new appreciation for how ridiculous uh, schooling can be. My girlfriend is a first grade school teacher. <laughs> mm. uh, and so hearing it firsthand is, you know, I, I would say the libertarian argument is a lot stronger <laughs> than, than we initially think. And, you know, as architects, I just want to make this point real quick is a very small percentage is actually going to maintain what we've built. You know, we've given the responsibility of the city to maintain far more than they could chew. I think what's hard for some people, like one guy in a class of mine, he's an architect. He calls his practice, they're like the secret designer. So he travels all over. He's been to Dubai, UAE, and his firm, he told me he's been a part of destroying governments <laughs> and rebuilding their economy, right? <laughs> like for, for corporations and stuff. <laughs> uh, so kind of like an economic hitman almost. Yeah, yeah. And so he was telling me that government has done phenomenal things for the modern economy and that the development patterns that we do are incredibly safe and secure. And, but then at the same time, he told me that he was a libertarian. <laughs> it's very confusing argument we had because he was saying that the, you know, like the Federal Reserve dollar has done a lot to stabilize governments. And then in the same breath, he was telling me he destabilized them. Right. It's an interesting thing where people are assuming that the situation is under control. Yeah, I mean, let's put it this way. I mean, there, there are a lot of governments out there who are in a lot worse shape than the U.S. government or than any, any state or local government within the U.S., right? So, yeah, I mean, you could imagine where somebody could come in and make some improvements or at least make some immediate improvements. You know, when you get, we don't need to get into foreign policy type of stuff here. But of course, yeah. when you, when all these, you know, you get into foreign aid and things like that, in the long run, there can be a lot of problems with the way that let's say, a foreign infusion of, of money or things like, you know, grain shipments and stuff, like what that does to the local agriculture um, in a given area. So uh, I can certainly imagine that there are a lot of governments around the world that can be improved by some kind of interventional action from, from a more stable government like the United States. But that's not a justification for government per se, right? <laughs> it's like Yeah. Well, I would say... <laughs> Uh, a version of that domestically is the infusion of money from like the state and federal level, right? Like it's yeah, easy to say yep. uh, like, hey, we're a small town. We got hit hard in the 08 recession. We lost our nuclear power plant, but we need a lot of grant money. And I think what it ends up doing is turning into a Band-Aid 
for a problem that's spewing from a lot of different holes, right? If you got like a 50 gallon barrel and it's been used on a gun range, right? There's two holes, <laughs> right? There's the entry and the exit. <laughs> I know Zion has been using grant money from the state of Illinois as a way of plugging one of the holes, but forgetting that there's one on the other side. Yeah. <laughs> and so what ends up happening is, you know, millions of dollars come and go. Mm -hmm. They're either eaten up in whatever program or budget or, you know, school system. Uh, usually it's the schools, right? Funding for that or funding for like police and fire or paying down some sort of debt. So it's kind of like the city sees these, you know, headlines and they're like, oh, well, we got that grant. So things are fine. But I think this is where I'm using it as a positive that the people are starting to pay a lot of close attention in Zion to their school district and seeing what their kids are doing and like the lack of learning that they're getting. Because I pointed out and I got a mom who I looked at her Facebook, you know, she's clearly not a libertarian. Mm -hmm. I pointed out that I said there aren't market forces working here. You know, there's no market. There's, there's, no, no, there's no feedback. There's, yeah, there's, there's, there's no feedback. There's no feedback mechanisms. And she liked my comment and said that is an incredible, insightful way of looking at it. Like, you know, <laughs> like she commented back and I just yeah. was like, oh, well, I wonder, you know, is she already coming from some point of view that I might share? And the thing is, is most people have never even been taught that they're, that the market creates feedback loops, you know, like, you know, they don't realize, you know, I always joke, you know, I use the cell phone as a perfect example. Like there's a reason why your cell phone now has a great camera, mm -hmm. right? Like it's because people reviewed the previous model and said that this is a terrible camera, right? <laughs> <laughs> right? Like there is a, a consumer feedback loop uh -huh. built into the tech, but we've built so much now that has no feedback loop. Yeah. Well, and. A big part of the reason for that, again, the uh, we've I've talked about kind of the moral, you know, problem with government and some of the let's say practical problems with the the impacts that it has, especially in the built environment. But fundamentally, I mean, that the, the fundamental let's say economic problem with a government in any given area is that it's a monopoly. It's a monopoly, and it's a monopoly that doesn't even charge prices for the things for, that it provides, <laughs> right? So generally, people say that, you know, the problem with the monopoly is that they're going to drive everybody else out of business and then make whatever they're producing either, you know, it's going to either become more expensive or that the quality is going to or that, you know, they're going to drop the quality because with nobody else to compete with them, there's no reason for them to keep improving their products. But with government, you don't even have that price signal <laughs> coming into the monopoly, right? So the government doesn't know, like, if we're, if we build this road, is that something people want? Like, is that something that people are willing, are willing to pay for? And you can imagine in a case where a road was built and had to pay for itself over time, that there would be some discussion where before we build this road, we're going to do a, you know, come up with a balance sheet and show how how and when this road is going to pay for itself and what that payment mechanism is and what the prices are that we should charge for this road, you know, for use of this road in order for it to be sustainable. But because government is monopoly, it has no, you know, there's nobody else going to come in and, and build another road that's going to put it out of business. <laughs> it has no incentive to try to even, to try to even figure that out, right? I mean, there's no, like nothing bad happens to to government if it builds a project that isn't successful other than people maybe complain a little bit about it but um you know and eventually yeah they can they can go broke which is what can eventually happen but for each of those individual decisions each of those individual projects they don't see that they don't see the feedback the problem is that they're building and they don't really care about whether or not that individual project can sustain itself over the long term because again it they're they're a monopoly and and Nothing bad happens to them if they're wrong. Yeah, I always use the tried example of, uh, you know, like there's the railroads originally, but I think like one of the early ones, you know, was clearly like the tech companies. Prior to Facebook, there was the MySpace situation and then early YouTube. And now they're starting to have these discussions about different types of competition. Whereas in the situation we're talking about is there is no option, right? Like, you know, in the current situation, if you're like, oh, well, I just want to go build some roads, right? Uh -huh. Like there's just no option for an alternative because there's actually no, even no market to be, you know, initially nationalized or something, right? Like it's just kind of building it and hoping things will occur so that, you know, it's like in the absence of a market, right? They just trying to create something that didn't even exist in the first place. Yeah. And I mean, the other side of that is, you know, for one thing, the government's on the supply side, right? They don't really know which projects are valuable or worthwhile, are going to be profitable and sustainable. But on the other side, 
the people using those services, the people using the roads, they pay nothing for it. I mean, they, I mean, obviously you pay through, through taxes generally, through taxes, through property taxes, through gas taxes and things like that. But they're not actually paying to use, let's say, the road that they drive down every day. And so what that does is it crowds out the possibility of somebody coming in and putting in, you know, putting in another road. Um, let's say there's one bridge going across a river. Maybe someone wants to put in another bridge and charge a toll for people to go across that bridge. Well, if people can use the first bridge for free, then there's got to be a really strong reason for somebody to build that second bridge. I mean, you can think about this. I mean, one good example is education, right? If I want to take my kids in and put them in a private school, I'm already paying the taxes to the town for my kids to be educated. So now I'd have to take them out, you know, and come up with money out of my own pocket to pay for a private school. So of course, the only private schools that get built by and large are schools for the wealthy, you know, people who can afford to both pay the taxes to the town and also send their kids to some private school. I mean, you can imagine like, like in the restaurant industry, right? In the food industry. I mean, God forbid, if governments like provided restaurants everywhere, right? And they were just giving people food. You go in, you just get food for free, right? I mean, first of all, you can imagine what the quality of that food would be like. But then the only other restaurants that would exist, like if somebody wanted to come in and have a little, I don't know, let's say a soul food place, right? Or have just, just some little kind of low cost food option. It'd be really hard for them to compete with this free government restaurant, right? That was right next door. And so the only restaurants that would be built would be high-end restaurants that people who could afford not to get the free food from the government restaurant would go and eat. And so by government providing, not just providing all of these services like schooling and like roads, but providing them for free and making them free and charging no price, it crowds out any possibility of competitive services being provided in any industry it touches. Yeah, the competition part, I think, is important for either side. There was a, a podcast I listened to where these two, I think it was on Bob Murphy's show, where they talked about these two economics professors traveled the world, and they noticed that in Cuba, the government started to allow private business to buy different uh, spices and different things like hmm. on the market. And it was just a handful, like a 15-part list, right? And they noticed that the, that the restaurants that were given that exemption had incredibly better food with just 15 <laughs> options, right? Like they were given 15 different options in yeah. the market. And so all of a sudden that they were providing a better product than like the rest of the restaurants in, you know, every restaurant was given a certain amount of ingredients. And so the food was the same everywhere, right? Cause like everyone was competing on a equal playing field <laughs> with a highly restricted market. And so I think that's something we're pointing out here is there is constant complaining about the education system, about what police are doing, about what the infrastructure is doing. And then you can point out and saying, well, this is what you have in a monopoly, right? Like in a true monopoly, there is zero incentive. I think this is where like some of Rothbard's writing is fascinating, where he points out that a true market monopoly would be the best product at the lowest possible price. Right. Until someone else came out with a better product at the best price. Right. Whereas a forced one, right? Like you can't go in and, you know, if I, I always joked, I'm like, well, I could just go open and slap myself with a badge just as I'm the new city hall. You know, eventually <laughs> someone's going to show up with a badge and a firearm and say, all right, uh, you know, knock it off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, there's like drier consequences to this, <laughs> uh, you know, prices. And I'm curious if you think that at least the, pragmatic approach in the short term until like real change is desired, right? By society. If the pragmatic approach I think is reasonable, right? Is it reasonable for me, to, for us as libertarians that have this idea that things could be improved upon, not utopian, but improved upon yeah. by just adjusting markets? So let me, and I'll say I have about five minutes, John, if that's all right with you. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We can wrap up. Maybe we can wrap up on this one. So, yeah. So I guess what I would say to that is that so I got into libertarianism like a little bit before, like the whole Ron Paul revolution of 2008 when he had his first run for, for president in 2012. That's when a lot of people who are now libertarians started hearing the message and really getting interested in it. And, you know, there's a big kind of meme going around that time, mostly centered around his campaign, which was end the Fed, right? Yep. <laughs> and the, the Federal Reserve, that, that was, this is a big uh, talking point of, of Ron Paul's, which is that we want to we end the Federal Reserve, right? But, you know, of course, that's it's like such an unachievable. I mean, yes, it, it's it's important to put that message out there and, and like make people think about, oh, yeah, this actually like isn't a good thing. Like the Federal Reserve does like cause a lot of problems and whatever. Yeah, that's a good conversation to have. But no one's going to end the Fed anytime soon, <laughs> at least by any, you know, libertarian type of action. So I think the way to approach it is to 
really break it down into some of the smallest components. And again, this is something where I think that looking at the built environment, I think there can be a lot of opportunities within within the built environment to start to experiment with some different types of changes. So for example, like this is I think something Strong Towns and, and certainly other people in the urbanist kind of community talk about is doing like temporary kind of changes to try out some different like let's say you take a street and you block it off and just make it pedestrian. Like let's just do that for a weekend and and see what happens. They block it off, you have a little block party and people go up and down it. And you know, eventually people decide that they like it. They like this walkability. They they like having these these little shops and stands and things all up and down the street that they can access, you know, and then eventually that becomes Times Square in New York, where it's now all essentially just pedestrian. And so from uh, in terms of applying or trying to achieve some libertarian ideas, I think we can look at that type of approach. Is, I mean, yes, you know, there are people fighting the good fight in, in state houses and maybe one or two in the federal government and and lots of people actually at the local level who are bringing libertarian um, ideas into their town. I actually, I grew up in New Hampshire and the, the Free State Project is a big movement around here that I've actually got to know a lot of people. I've, I've spoken at a couple of their events and sponsored some of their events recently. And I've been really impressed with both the community that they've built as well as what they've been able to achieve kind of politically. And I'm not, I'm not into politics. I'm not a political guy really at any level. Um, but I'm, I'm glad that there are some people who are and who are kind of fighting that good fight. But I think that that to really bring about more radical types of ideas, I think you just have to start small and find one one little piece of something that you can change to start to show how something can work. So maybe if you're in a town, maybe a town like Zion, right, that has problems sustaining, let's say, its infrastructure and stuff. Maybe like that example you gave of this road that that they want to develop and change around to make to make this development on. Maybe you go to the town and say, look, it, we're, you have this road here. We're just going to take this little section of road. Let's get it off your books. We'll take it on as a, and maybe it's not a road. Maybe it's a little, you know, a little system of roads, maybe within a development or something. Let's take that responsibility and the ownership of that away from government. Maybe we don't own it. Maybe it becomes like a, a lease kind of thing, a 50-year lease or a 100-year lease or whatever, where you're giving us the ability to charge people to use this space and to maintain it and to reap whatever profits we can get from that. And let's just see what we can do with that and see if we can make that work. And then the worst case that happens is it doesn't work out. They go bankrupt and the road goes back to the city and they're just right back where they started. So, you know, they haven't really lost anything other than that in that period of time, the city hasn't had the expense of maintaining that particular section of road, let's say. So I think that trying to find the word you used before, small bets, right? Yep. <laughs> Both within the built environment, as also and also within the sphere of responsibilities that government has. Like it's not like we're gonna shut down city hall, you know, and, and over a weekend. It's that we're gonna look at all of the, the various things that any government does and say, you know what? Could we that one thing you do over here, right? The, I don't know the sewage treatment plant. So why does the the organization that's hiring our teachers and educating our kids and operating the police? Why do they need to run a sewer treatment plant? Like maybe we take that and find a way to move that off the government's books and into, I would say, into private hands. But it doesn't. But that can still be a public form of ownership. You can certainly have co-ops. There are a lot of utilities that are owned as a co-op type of arrangement. We've on our podcast introduced this idea we called opt-in trusts, which is it's an organization that would own some asset, whether it's a road or a utility or something, and you would give people the right to join it as an owner or the option to leave it as an owner. So maybe, you know, owners, maybe if, if I'm an owner of the sewage treatment plant, maybe I pay less on my sewer bill for what I'm actually using. Or maybe if that operation is profitable, I get some of those profits kicked back to me. Whereas somebody who decides they don't want to take on the responsibility of owning this big piece of infrastructure that they owe nothing about, they shouldn't be forced to become an owner of that and to be burdened by the debt that that might incur and to make decisions about how that's managed. So the point being that when you're coming up with ways that people can own, that you can start to privatize, or again, we don't really like that word, but let's say divest, that you can start to divest government assets, government infrastructure, and government responsibilities, you can find ways to do that in which there could still be a very, let's say, public type of ownership structure where people who are current stakeholders in that system could still have the option of, of remaining stakeholders in that system. They could stand to benefit if it does well. They might be responsible for costs if it doesn't do well, and then they might have incentives there to find ways to better manage it, just like every other business does. 
or eventually if it really goes bad, then maybe they find somebody who's maybe it essentially goes bankrupt and then an operator is able to come in and acquire those assets at low cost and then run the thing profitably moving forward. So there are a lot of different ways that you can think about different forms of ownership of certain things. But again, I think that this idea of looking at, at individual little parts and pieces of all the myriad of things that governments do and say, is there one of these things that we can take away that we can just try, try doing something different with? Can we try to take this and have this sewage plant become a co-op where people are paying into that? It's off the government's books and we make all of that work. There are different ways, I think, to be thinking about how these things could be run in a way that doesn't disenfranchise people who already perceive themselves as having some ownership of that entity or some right to use its services. Yeah, I think that's a good way to kind of wrap up on, you know, it's like we're just trying to provide, you know, reasonable alternatives that are either a rehashing of old ideas, you know, from history or presenting things that we've learned now that we have a body of knowledge of like, OK, you know, we've had, uh, you know, three generations of the property tax model, right, trying to solve what we have now. Maybe there's a better way of going about it. What we have now is is people when when some problem comes up. That people's first, this is like you listen to like any story on NPR and it's like, you know, here's this problem that somebody's having. Here's what this opponent of whatever says is the problem. And here's what the government should do about it. <laughs> right? It's like this is knee jerk reaction that whenever some problem comes up that we need to look to government in order to solve it. And of course, that gets very disappointing when government isn't able to solve those problems, because, of course, as we've said, they have many other priorities. So I think that this libertarian mindset, whether or not you want to go you know, whole hog and, and say that you can imagine a world in which government doesn't do all the things that it does now, you don't have to get there. But having this perspective that maybe there are ways to do things where we don't rely on government, where that's not our first response, that maybe that's more of a last resort and that we try to find other ways to solve these problems and do everything we can to make those things happen without relying on taxation and without re relying on the kind of authority and regulations that governments wield all too easily. Yeah, I think it's a good uh, a good point to wrap up on. Just want to say thanks for for doing this. It's been fun uh catching up again and kind of uh, you know, rehashing some of these things that were totally new for me, you know, learning, right? Uh the first time we chatted, you know, and I think the the podcast that you guys do provides a lot. And, uh, you know, maybe we'll see if I keep this one going or not. Um, uh, right. It, it, it is, it is for a class, but I, I think I'm so invested in podcast culture and continual conversations that maybe it could be a on and off thing, you know, as I find, uh, need to, to kind of vent, uh, either, you know, vent for personal need or just wanting to, you know, spread information. Yeah. I mean, I'll say that, you know, podcasting for, I mean, you know, we do it. My brother lives in Australia and he and I just started this up as kind of a little side project, something that we could collaborate on while we're living so far apart. But it really has opened a lot of opportunities for us. I mean, the fact that I was able to meet and interview Patrick Schumacher, you know, principal of Zahai Adid Architects, Chuck Marone and, and all of the, you know, all these other, we haven't interviewed that many people, but I feel like having this podcast has kind of opened some doors both for for Joe and I to explore these ideas in ways that we otherwise wouldn't have, and also for us to meet and engage with people who we really admire, who are talking about all kinds of different ideas, whether that's in libertarianism or in architecture and the built environment. Yeah, it's definitely a fascinating conversation you had with Patrick Schumacher. That uh, that was <laughs> yeah. a, a good a good get there, but. I'm sure he was excited to talk to people that actually uh, took him <laughs> very seriously and didn't think he was, you know, some new coming of some evil <laughs> dictator or something. <laughs> I hope so. I hope so. Yeah, no, if, if, I know. I really enjoyed getting to know Patrick and, and our conversation we had with him. And, and I don't know, I'd like to think that I helped him to, uh, <laughs> to realize that he wasn't alone in, in some of these views that he was being excoriated for um, after that infamous talk he gave on, uh, on housing policy. <laughs> yeah, I know. He, uh, I saw when he was on the Tom Woods show, I was fascinated by it, but I could tell there are some people who are like drastically confused <laughs> in the <laughs> comment section. And I was like, Ooh, this is when you fully realize like how, uh, how much in our own world architecture is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what we're here for. We're trying to, to give people that vocabulary to start to understand, um, you know, this intersection between how things get developed and, and libertarian thought. Yeah, definitely. Well, hopefully you guys keep on keeping on. It's great conversations. And then we'll see if I keep on doing this. Uh, you know, I definitely think there's room in the market for multiple architecture 
libertarian podcasts. <laughs> Maybe we could have you just start doing our pod since we only put out a podcast like once every three months. <laughs> Maybe we'll have you fill in for us. <laughs> Yeah, uh, definitely. We could talk about that. That would be awesome. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm, I'm you'll, be, about, you'll be like I, our you'll be like our man on the street. We'll send you out to uh, to interview all kinds of architects and things for us. Yeah, I uh, a joke because I when, I when I I only took eight months off from grad to undergrad, but I realized how much slower real life is versus school. <laughs> yeah, I slept seven hours for the first time in two weeks last night. <laughs> oh, man. I don't miss those days. <laughs> uh, so I was like, I told my girlfriend, I was like, well, when we move in together, I'm all of a sudden going to have like this time. And she's like, what are you going to do? And I was like telling her about, you know, like, you know, this and like me wanting to help cities and stuff like that. And so I was like, all, all this stuff. She's like, wow, are you actually going to try to get a lot done? I was like, well, I just spent all this money on architecture school. I might as well use it. <laughs> yeah, I got to do something. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, I'm not going to just sit in a chair all day on Revit. <laughs> <laughs> Which is what I do, by the way, but that's all right. <laughs> well, I mean, you still have like the family and other things. Oh, yeah, like no, that. yeah, believe me. No, I, I, waste, I waste plenty of time while sitting at my desk during the day. That's cool. Well, well good luck with your project, John, and, and um, with finishing out your, your education. And hopefully we can, we'll talk a little more. Definitely. I'll, uh, I'm going to try to see if I can get a recording of my thesis presentation to share with you guys. That'd be great. Yeah, I'm consolidating the intro part, you know, where I can explain like the big bet thing in a concise way. But when I get to the app stuff, it's kind of fun. A lot of people, you know, perk up and they're like, oh, he's trying to reinvigorate, you know, local urban. You know, it's like I'm seeing that a lot of people from different architects in the building, Uh you know, from the energy guys to the green people, to the designers, to the detail oriented, they're all seeing what it's doing. You know, they're like, they're thinking about it differently. So I'm really excited. Very cool. For the thesis day. (laughs) Great. Well, good luck with it. Yeah. Thanks for chat. Yeah. And thanks for recording on your end, just in case something didn't work out. (laughs) Yeah. Hopefully one of us got it. (laughs) Yep, for sure. All right. Thank you, Tim. All right. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks for listening to An Architecture Podcast, the built environment of a stateless society. Visit anarchitecturepodcast.com to follow our blog and social media and find out how you can support us through Patreon or with cryptocurrency. They shouldn't be forced to become an owner of that and to be burdened by the debt that that might incur and to make decisions about how that's managed. And so, sorry, my phone's ringing here. Michael Heiss keeps posting in the uh, Mises Caucus page, and I keep on getting those notifications. (laughs) Um, So, oh, God, this is annoying. We'll have to edit this out. (laughs) It rings on my computer and on my phone, so I'm like, okay, here we go. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You have the Mac. Yeah. Yeah, All right. So, here we go. So, um, um, I'm saying about the opt-in trust and yeah, like okay. being able to leave. Right. So so the point being that